This lecture is the first one about optimal control. This is a, a new, completely new subject to you, and you will understand why. Let me give you uh, a, the overview of what we are going to study. First, we are going to study dynamic optimization problems. Uh, some of you have followed a course on optimization, uh, but this is dynamic optimization problems and you will understand the difference after uh, a few slides. Actually, this is more difficult because the optimization space is infinite dimensional. Let's see what do I mean by this and what are the techniques that we have available. Then I will introduce the first or the main working horse to solve our problems, Pontryagin's principle. Actually, I could just give a lecture with just one slide or two slides if you want, one slide to formulate the optimal control problem and the second slide to state Pontryagin's principle and that's it. But of course, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to explore Pontryagin's principle. So the beauty of the thing comes from the fact that from just four equations, you get a set of conditions to design your controller. So in principle, it's simple to use. Uh, the difficulty comes from uh, the new situations where it, that it concerns. Uh, to understand Pontryagin's principle, we will start by studying problems with free end state. That is to say, you want to uh, manage a system for a while, can be uh, many things. For instance, you want to design a therapy for cancer and you want to uh, minimize the amount of drug and at the same time you want to minimize the size of the tumor <clears throat> so you have a compromise and both things are related by a state a nonlinear state model and uh, so we are going to see how to solve these problems with Pontryagin's principle then I will make a proof of Pontryagin's principle in one particular case that will allow you to understand how, where it comes from, what is behind. And uh, then I will consider two special cases of problems. The first class of problems are problems in which you want to operate a system and you want to force the final state to be imposed. For instance, you want to move a robot from one point to another point by minimizing the energy. So when you say that you want that the final point of the robot, the final state could be a geometrical point or could be the geometrical point together with the final velocity. When you impose this, you are making an imposition on the final state. And we need to modify a little bit the basic formulation of Pontryagin's principle and to learn how to tackle these problems. And the other class of problems is the linear quadratic problem. So we assume that we have a linear dynamics for the system that we want to control and we have a quadratic cost. Let's later see what is this. So, uh, what are the objectives? The objectives of this set of lectures that form the last uh, part of our course is to introduce a novel class of optimization problems that are solved with respect to infinite dimensional variables. And this class of problems form what we call optimal control. If you want to uh, read my book, uh, it's uh, this uh, initial chapter, this initial lecture on optimal control, 
is on chapter 10. And then you have other chapters devoted that I will mention afterwards. So let's start by understanding what do we mean by uh, infinite dimensional problems. And uh, this is a classical one. Suppose that you have two points in a plane, in a vertical plane. So our page is like this vertical plane. When you look at the computer, you see the slide in the vertical position. So you have point A and point B. And you have a wire that connects point A and point B. And you have a bed. Bed in Portuguese is uh, an anel, small ring that is attached to the to the wire. So the picture is not entirely correct. It does not roll. It slides. Okay, the the ring is around the wire, so that when you leave it, due to the force of gravity, it slides from A to B. Let's assume that it slides without friction. Now, you can ask yourself the problem, which is, what is the shape of the wire that uh, makes the bed move from A to B in minimum time, just acted by gravity? So you don't have any motors here, just the force of gravity. Now, what are the... How, how can we, we solve this problem? You have a basic knowledge about optimization problems. And uh, if you want, you have learned how to solve optimization problems, at least very basic ones, in the first years when studying mathematical analysis and derivatives. And one uh, application of derivatives is to find minimum or maximum. So if you have a function and you want to find out the minimum of the function, you have to differentiate the fun function with respect to the argument and equate the derivative to zero. And the zeros of the derivative are candidates to be minimum. They could also be a maximum or inflection points, but they are candidates to be minimum as well. So uh, you could think of a strategy which is let's compute the time as a function of the shape of the wire and then differentiate the time, the time of travel between A and B, differentiate it with respect to some characteristic of some parameters that define the shape and then equate to zero. Now, you have a problem because I'm not assuming a particular type of curve. If I were assuming that the curve was a sinus or a cosinus or a polynomial, then it would be okay. But uh, I'm letting the curve to be almost entirely free. The only thing that I ask is that it is smooth. That is to say it's continuous and it has continuous uh, derivatives. So uh, you can plot any curve. You can plot any curve between A and B. And uh, how many numbers do you need to define a curve? Some of you are tempted to say two because you have X and Y, but actually it's infinity. You need an infinity number to specify an infinity number of points, each one with two coordinates, okay? But it's an infinity number of points that you have to specify. So you would be needed to compute the derivatives of the time with respect to an infinity number of points. And of course, this is not possible at all. You could consider approximations, say, uh, assume that the curve is a polynomial or it's a spline. And uh, then you would have a finite number of parameters that define the polynomial or define the spline or define any uh, other class of curves and differentiate with respect to that. But we want to say more 
about this. So we want to actually exactly solve the problem of going from A to B. Okay, this slide explains how to compute the, this slide and the next one, how to compute the time, as you, you can see, the time of travel. I, I won't do the details here, but you can read the slides, it's not much important. Uh, the final result is interesting because uh, you have an, an integral of the function y of x, and y of x defines the curve that defines the shape of the wire, and g is the acceleration of gravity. So as you can see here, if I give you a, a given curve, you can compute the travel time, but we want to solve a different problem. We want to find the shape of y such that the travel time is minimum. This is an example in which we say, well, it's a straight line. So you can compute the travel time. Okay? You can compute the travel time as a function of the slope of the straight line, which in, depends on the coordinates of A and B. But if you have another shape, you get another number. Now, what is the shape that gives you the smallest travel time? Okay? So this is the problem. You, you can have an infinite number of shapes. Here I just have three. Well, three is uh, still a long uh, road up to infinity, but I think that you understand the, the idea. And to which shape you, you have a time now, a travel time. Now, what is the shape that gives you the smallest travel time possible? This problem was formulated. Uh, more than 300,000 years ago, you see? It was formulated in 1667 by Johann Bernoulli. Uh, much of you have heard the name Bernoulli and think it's a person. Actually, it's a family. Uh, more or less, this, around the 17th century, there were five Bernoullis, all preeminent scientists and mathematicians, above all. And since then, you can count more than 100 members of the same Bernoulli family making contributions to science. So it's a little bit like, like Strauss in music, where you have many Strausses. Uh, only a few of them have, have composed uh, waltzes. Uh, and uh, this one, Johann Bernoulli, he published uh, challenge to the scientific com community. So uh, you can imagine that 300 years ago there was a scientific journal, this was in Holland, and uh, that was published in Latin because it was Latin at the time was fulfilling the role that now English does or what we call English because this is not really the English ling language that we use to communicate but we do communicate. And at the time, 300 years ago, people were communicating uh, using Latin. So Latin was a language that allowed uh, someone in Hungary to correspond with someone in France or with someone in the UK. And uh, uh, he published this challenge in this scientific journal. And uh, he said, well, I know the solution. But this is so interesting that I'm challenging uh, other solutions. If no one publishes any solution, presents any solution, then I will publish my solution after one year. And actually, uh, six of the most brilliant minds of the time proposed solutions. Some incognitus, for instance, Newton. And there is a, a legend, which is probably it's not true, that. Uh, uh, I think it was Leibniz who said, well, I recognize the lion by his claws, mentioning the work of Newton. Newton uh, was uh, the head, was the director of an institution that was producing coins in London. 
And uh, so it was a bureaucratic, uh, sometimes with uh, traces of uh, police work that he had to do. It was, it was very heavy. And uh, the story is that he came home uh, very tired with a tremendous headache due to the, all the work that he had been doing that day. And uh, he solved the problem to relax a little. So he provided uh, a solution. Actually, when he published the, the solution that he sent was just a solution and not, not the derivation of the solution. But uh, some others uh, produced solutions and Jacob, the brother of uh, Bernoulli, you must say that all in this family, everybody was litigating with everybody. Okay? Uh, so I think this was jo Johan that uh, uh, expelled uh, one of his sons out of his house because he won uh, a distinction from the French Academy of Sciences and Johan wanted to himself. So he sent his son away from this house because of that, because he was jealous of the son. That's incredible. They were always litigating. And Jacob, uh, he solved the problem. I think that uh, was Leibniz that presented the problem to Jacob. And uh, well, this is just a curiosity, but much more important was that Jacob uh, solved the problem with a very uh, much different point of view, introducing quite different ideas from the one from Johann Bernoulli. And uh, these ideas turn out to be the basis of uh, an enormous activity that is now going on on adaptive control. But this is something that we cannot speak about. Okay, if you want to, to have, uh, to have a, a panoramic view of, of the evolution of ideas from this problem called the Brachistochron problem. Brachistochron problem means chron comes from the Greek chronos, that means time. In Brachisto, Brachisto, Brachistos means uh, uh, least. So it was a problem of least time. And uh, it was a long way to optimal control problems. So you can, you can uh, try to read this uh, paper. This is a tutorial paper, which is quite interesting. As you can see, uh, this problem uh, was very popular. For instance, at Museu de Física da Universidade de Coimbra, you can, if you click in your slides here, you can uh, have a guided tour, a virtual tour to this museum. It's quite interesting. And you can see instruments of the 18th century to uh, demonstrate these optimal curves. Okay, but I was mentioning optimal control. And if you look at the problem that I just mentioned, it's an infinite dimensional problem. It's very simple in the formulation. That's why I selected it. Uh, it's difficult, more, much more difficult in the solution. Uh, but uh, it's not control. You don't have a control variable. Actually, you can turn it into a control problem. It's nice because we have a geometrical problem. We are trying to find the shape of a curve. But uh, there is a way of turning geometrical problems into equivalent control problems. I will give you an example um, still today. And as you can see, you jump from the, seven, the end of the 17th century to 1956, when uh, Pontryagin's uh, published his maximum principle. So the maximum principle is a set of uh, conditions to solve optimal control problems. And you can see here Pontryagin, it seems that he's looking at us, but he was blind. He, was, he became blind at the age of 14, and his mother was a kind of secretary in public relations to him. And that helped him uh, through all his life was his eyes. 
She knew nothing about mathematics, by the way. Now, optimal control. I've been speaking about optimal control, but let me give you one example of an optimal control problem. Suppose that you want to optimize therapy for cancer. So uh, you can write a number of state, nonlinear state equations that we use to represent the system of uh, cancer in the body. And uh, of course, you have a number of disturbances, variables that uh, act from this outside the system. But you have two other sets of variables. One are manipulated inputs, that are the drug doses that you impose to the body. So you can consider this as control variables because you can manipulate them. Uh, you can have sequence of pills or you can have a continuous infusion of some drug. That's what the situation that we are considering. When we have a continuous infusion, infusion of some drug through the veins. And then you have the output, which is the observed reaction, for instance, the tumor size or some measure of tumor activity that you can take out of radiographs or something, some analysis. So you can formulate this problem. Okay, let's have the simplest model of tumor evolution and call X the size of the tumor. And one possibility is to have this so-called Gompertz model where M, alpha and beta are uh, parameters that depend on the body and the type of tumor. U is the manipulated variable, variable so the uh, rate of application of drug infusion, and X is the tumor size. So you have this, uh, if you have uh, U equal to zero, it, it looks a little bit funny, but uh, um, what happens, or looks a little bit peculiar, we have the lower written. But what happens is that X grows like, an S function, so it starts growing exponential, exponentially, then the rate decreases, and then it stabilizes in a value where X is equal to M. For X equal to M, uh, you have M divided by M here, which is one, so the logarithm of one is zero, so X dot is zero. So for X equal to M, you have an equilibrium point, okay? If X is smaller than M, then X grows because this is positive. Now, if you have the drug, uh, the drug acts uh, in a negative way, so reduces the rate of growth. So you can, by applying uh, enough values of drug, uh, you, you are able to make the derivative negative if the second term dominates the first one and make the rate of growth of the tumor become negative, that is to say the tumor is decreasing. Now, the problem is that drugs have a tox toxic effect. So how can you formulate this problem? You want to uh, apply the therapy during some time, say a uh, certain number of weeks, and at the end you want to minimize the resulting size of the tumor. But at the same time, you want to minimize the total amount of drug that you have applied. So you formulate it mathematically in this way. You have something, which is, I call it a cost function, and uh, capital T is the end of the interval of time starting, you are operating from zero up to capital T. So X of T is the final size of the tumor, okay? And if U is the rate of application of infusion of drug infusion, then the integral of U is nothing more than the to total amount of drug that you have applied to the patient. And you have this parameter rho that gives you a balance. So you have the objective of minimizing uh, the final size of the tumor and the total amount of drug. But these are conflicting 
uh, objectives. So uh, what happens is uh, that you have, uh, you build a balance in the way, this way and say rho equal to zero means don't bother about the drug that you are applying. Uh, you want to mean just to minimize x. Of course, in this case, the solution would be apply u as large as possible. And if u is between, uh, is below some u max, must be above zero because you cannot extract drug from the patient. Uh, so you have this formulation here. Okay? In, for general values of u, uh, this term will be present. So you want to minimize, you want to minimize this uh, functional with respect to the function u. For each function u, you solve the differential equation, you get an x. So this is a number, okay? But it's a number that depends on the function u de defined in the interval between zero and t, in capital T. So when you select a function u, you can compute this integral. And you also can compute x of t because you integrate this equation with the specified function u. Okay, now you want to solve a kind of inverse problem, which is what is the function u that minimizes this j2, this cost functional, subject to the dynamics of x that relate x and u, and this constraint on u. So, this is a typical optimal control problem. So in general, we, have, we are going to consider for the moment, later we are going to generalize it a little bit in a way that I will tell you. Uh, we can consider this class of optimal control problems uh, that are characterized by fixed final time, no state constraints. And, uh, you must have a nonlinear state model that relates, relates your manipulated variable, your control variable with a state, x dot equal to f of x and u, with some initial condition. And t belongs to uh, the interval of time in which you are operating the system. So you assume that you are operating the system between t equal to zero and t equal to capital T, with capital T fixed. And uh, at each time, your uh, manipulative variable must belong to some set. Uh, this set can be, uh, suppose that u is a scalar. So this set can be, for instance, any real number or uh, an interval of real numbers, say between zero and maximum value, as in the previous example, or between minus some value, some negative value, and plus some positive value, okay? Usually it's a, a, an interval. And uh, uh, the other element is the cost function. The cost function, J of U, is a function of functions. That is to say, it maps a function U in a real number, okay? And it's made of two parts. It's made of two parts that are added together. You have an integral of a function of x and u. We call it the Lagrangian or running cost. And uh, this is related to what happens during the inter optimization interval. And then you have something that penalizes the final state. Okay, and this is, fun this is a function psi. Okay, this is the Greek letter, capital Psi. Uh, I could have used any other letter, but I use this Psi, uh, which is a function of the final state. So uh, in the previous case, Psi of xt was just x of t, and L of xu was just u, was the, the problem, uh, multiplied by some rho, some weight rho, that allows you to that in the first case. But we can have different possibilities for Psi and L. Now, two comments. One comment is that I'm, I'm going first to assume that the time is fixed. 
This rules out, at least for the moment, situations in which you say, I want to go, I have a robot, I want to drive the, the robot uh, from one point to another in the least possible time, the minimum possible time. And you cannot do it because the time of operation is fixed. But later we are going to generalize this the solution to this problem to situation situations where t is fixed. So for the moment be patient and assume that t is fixed. The other comment that I want to do is this uh, calling this Lagrangian. Okay, the expression Lagrangian has three different meanings in mathematics. One meaning is the running cost that you see here, but there are also two other meanings. One meaning is the Lagrangian of uh, constrained optimization, the method of Lagrange multipliers. You build a function, an enlarged function, which is the Lagrangian. Maybe some of you have heard of it. It has nothing to do with this Lagrangian. And uh, the other thing is the Lagrangian in physics the difference between potential and kinetic energy. Again, it's a different story. Although in that case of physics, it's quite related to uh, what you have here. So I'm when I say Lagrangian, I mean Lagrangian in the sense that it's the integrand function of uh, the cost written in this way. Okay, so this is the problem. If you are able, actually this is a class of problems. If you are able to cast your problem in this in this form, then uh, by applying a set of conditions that I'm going to present in a moment, you will be able to solve your specific problem. So for specific values of f, of l, and of psi, uh, you have a particular problem, and then I'm going to present a set of conditions satisfied by the solution of this problem. That the solution is the function u be defined between zero and capital T that gives you the minimum value for the functional. Okay, so this is the formulation. Let's look at the solution. Okay, so the solution is given by this uh, simple form of Pontryagin's maximum principle. I said it's a form because you can generalize ma Pontiagin's maximum principle, for instance, for uh, final time free. So, uh, this Pontiagin's maximum principle is a set of conditions satisfied by the optimal control in the optimal state. And now you have a third actor, which is this lambda, you see. This lambda is a function of time that we call the cost state, okay? So uh, when you have an optimal trajectory of x and u, you are going also to have uh, an optimal trajectory for this lambda that I'm going to define in a moment. And Pontryagin's maximum principle states conditions satisfied by x, u, and lambda along an optimal trajectory. What do I mean by an optimal trajectory? Suppose that u is an optimal function. You integrate the state equation to get x, that's the optimal x, and then you are going to integrate another equation to get lambda, that's the optimal lambda, with this u and x. Now, along an optimal trajectory for x, u, and lambda, you must satisfy these conditions that are written here. Of course, the first condition is that x and u must be related by the state equation of the plane that you are optimizing. So x dot must be equal to f of x and u with a specified initial condition for the state. And at each time, t, in the interval zero up to capital T, you must uh, fulfill this property that uh, the optimal value of u uh, at each time t, this is a number, is in the set of admissible uh, values for the control. So 
uh, can be anything, can be within some interval, say between zero and one, or zero and, and 100, or zero and five. So this is the first set of conditions. Now you have a differential equation for lambda. You see, uh, this prime here means transpose. So, and the dot means the derivative. So this is a differential equation because you have the symmetric of the transpose of the derivative is equal to blah, 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 where you have f of x and l of x. f of x is obtained from f by computing the Jacobian. So this is the matrix of first derivatives of f with respect to x. And this is the gradient of the running cost with respect to x. Computed at the optimal trajectory. So this gives you actually a differential equation for lambda that depends on x and u in general. And uh, now, to specify lambda, you need to specify an initial condition. In this case, this initial condition is actually a terminal condition. So the terminal condition is the gradient, the terminal condition of the cost state lambda is the gradient of the terminal cost. Remember that psi is, was the terminal cost. Let's look at it again. You see psi was the terminal, the function that defines the terminal cost. And uh, you compute this derivative, and then you make x equal to x of t. And then, very important, you must define the Hamiltonian function, which is lambda transposed f of x and u. Okay, read this v as in u, plus l of x and u. Okay, and uh, so this is the control, this v is the control. And now the most important thing, at each time t, at each time t, the Hamiltonian is a maximum with respect to this control v. So for v equal to the optimal control u, h is maximum, okay? Now, at this moment, you are thinking to yourself, I'm never going to learn this stuff. It's not true, okay? Believe, believe me, trust me. We need to do problems and we need to explore this and things will become much clearer. First of all, what is the important stuff here? You are optimizing with respect j, with respect to a function u. And now you are optimizing, you reduce the problem of uh, your optimal control problem that initially was optimize, uh, optimize your cost function with respect to a function u. Now, at each time t, you optimize the Hamiltonian with respect to u, u of t. For, for each t, u of t is just a scalar, if u is a scalar, okay? If u is a, is a, matrix, is a vector, then uh, h, at, his, at each time t, h is a vector function, but it's a function of a finite, finite dimensional vector because it is for each t. So you have transformed an infinite dimensional problem, which was optimized with respect to a function, to a finite dimensional problem, which is optimized the Hamiltonian with respect to the control at each time. Now you have an infinite number of, optimal, of um, optimization problems to solve, but each problem is a finite dimensional, actually with a very low dimension because H depends on just one variable, the control variable at each time t. And usually you can uh, solve all this, uh, inf this set of infinite, infinite problems, this infinite set of problems, uh, in, in a symbolic way uh, in that class. Let's see an example, okay? So these are, these are the definitions of uh, when I have a scalar as a function of x, I define this is the gradient, okay? 
this is nothing more than the derivatives of the function psi with respect to x1, etc. The same for Lx. And uh, when f is a vector, so uh, this is, you have the uh, Jacobian of f with respect to x, the matrix of first derivatives. Okay? And I call, as I said, lambda, I call it the co-state. And uh, the equation verified by lambda is the adjoint equation. Okay. Some names that I'm going to use. Okay, let's jump this for a while because this refers to extensions, possible extensions. Some of them we are going to study, some of them we are not going to study. Some bibliographic references that, that you can see if you want to go deeper, but my book is more than enough for you. So, uh, I will do just today just one exercise to warm you up. And um, this is an exercise, you could anticipate the, the response. But uh, next Friday, we are going to solve one problem, which is not so complicated, and for which you are not able to anticipate the solution. So, uh, the problem is this, it's a kind of segue. Suppose that we have a curve that starts uh, for x is a scalar, and uh, it's a function of time, and you know that x of zero is zero. And uh, you want to, to find this curve uh, that such that when t is equal to capital T, the eight, so the value of x for t equal to capital T is maximum. Okay? And the slope of the curve, assumed to be smooth, that is to say uh, it's uh, continuous and differentiable for all t, the maximum slope is one. Okay, this is a geometrical problem. How can I turn this into a uh, optimal control problem? So uh, define your curve in this way. So x dot is equal to u where u is a slope. So this is a trick that you can use to transform uh, geometrical problems into optimal control problems. So uh, say that the derivative of x is the slope. This is by definition. And now take u as your manipulated variable. And you know that u is such that it is smaller than one, smaller or equal to than one. There is an equal sign here. This is not strictly smaller, but it's smaller or equal to one. I apologize for that. And you have this initial condition. And you want to select u such that this quantity j of u, which is just the final value of x, is maximum. Okay? Now, the solution is obvious. What is it? How can you, how can you select u such that uh, you might maximize this quantity? Of course, is just select u equal to the maximum value of one, and you will reach the maximum point. But let's see what the Pontryagin's principle uh, say, says. So uh, you have to compare, well, this is the, your state equation. And your state equation is very simple. So your f is just equal to u. Now your j, let's go back to the general case. Your j, remember, should be a psi of x of t plus an integral of L of x of t. Now, in your case, uh, x of j is just x of t, so psi is the identity. So psi is just x of t, and L is zero. That's, in this way, you can recast the problem, your problem, in this general formulation, and apply the formulas of Pontryagin's principle. So, uh, we have to write equation for lambda. 
And uh, so we have to compute the Jacobian of f with respect to x <coughs> and of l with respect to x. And also the terminal uh, value of lambda implies computing the gradient of the final cost with respect to x. Now, f, you remember, is just u, so that the derivative of f with respect to x is zero. And uh, l is zero, so lx is also zero. So everything is zero. This means that, and lambda is a scalar, so forget about the transpose, minus lambda dot equal to zero. This means that lambda is constant. The derivative is zero, lambda is constant. Now, you have a final value, you have a final value uh, condition for lambda, okay? And this is given by the derivative of psi with respect to x. Now, psi is equal to x. So if you compute the derivative, this is just one. And if you make x equal to x of t, well, one for x equal to x of t is just one. So the final value of lambda is one, and lambda is constant. This means, this means that lambda is always one, okay? Now, go to the Hamiltonian, and lambda is one, f is u, l is zero, so h is nothing more than u. And you want to, at each, each time, time instant to find u that maximizes h. This is nothing more than uh, finding uh, or then selecting u equal to its maximum value, which is one. So the optimal control is just one, as we have anticipated, okay? You, you can say, well, but after all this effort, uh, we could solve a problem that is was obvious. Uh, in the next uh, class, we are going to, uh, let me jump this example, we are going to solve a different problem. And it's a simple problem, but you cannot anticipate the solution. And the problem is this, suppose that you have a push card, and I, I represent the push card just by a double integrator. So x1 is the position, x2 is the velocity, so the deriv derivative of uh, the position is the velocity, x1 dot is equal to x2, and the derivative of the velocity is the force. I'm assuming I'm normalizing by the mass of the car, assuming it's one or whatever. So these are the state equations. You have an f1, which is x2, and an f2, which is u. And now we have a cost that says, I want to maximize this quantity, this difference here. What is the first part? The part is the total space traveled up to time t. So you operate the car between zero and capital T. And you want to move it as uh, far away as you can. So x1 of t, capital T, must be as big as you want, as you can. But now uh, I'm penalizing the square of the force. The square of the force is proportional to the energy. So we call this a minimum energy problem or a mixed minimum energy problem because you have this here, okay? And I put a minus here because I want to minimize the energy, but I want to maximize everything else. So to transform, transform a minimization problem into a maximization problem so that I can add both things together, I put a minus here. And this one half, well, could be any weight. And this weight would give you uh, a balance between go as fast, as far away as you can and spending as least uh, energy uh, as you can. Okay, so these are uh, competitive actions. Now, you can think, what is the shape of you? What is the shape of you that optimizes this quantity? Shape of the function u, when u t is defined between t equal to zero and t equal to capital T. 
probably you will reach the, the conclusion that you will uh, decrease. But decrease is like a straight line, like uh, some quadratic function, a polynomial uh, of higher order, some modification of the sine function or the cosine function or some, some other function we don't know. That is not obvious at all. And uh, next class, I'm going to solve this problem applying the conditions of Pontryagin's principle. And you are going that in a very straightforward way, you are able to solve this problem, which is no longer trivial. So to sum up today, what have we uh, learned? First of all, I've introduced to you a new class of optimal of control problems. These are optimal control problems that rely on um, a on a different class of optimization problems in which you are optimizing with respect to a function, not to a finite dimensional vector. So in this sense, they are infinite dimensional uh, optimization problems. And then I've introduced to you uh, a class of these problems related to control, where you want to operate a system by minimizing some cost functional, that is to say, some mapping between the control uh, variable and the state and a real number, and you want that you want to maximize or minimize. And uh, the most important thing are Pontryagin's principle. Pontryagin's principle are a set of conditions for uh, the solution that the solution must satisfy. They are necessary conditions. They are not necessary and sufficient. They are just necessary conditions. But these conditions are able to uh, transform the infinite dimensional problem into a problem in which you optimize the Hamiltonian function at each time t. And this is a finite dimensional optimization problem. So these are the most important things. And that's all for today. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we'll meet again uh, next Friday. Bye-bye. Professor. Uh-huh. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, 